Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. In the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara sees that all five skandhas, form feeling perceptions, impulses, and consciousness, are characterized by emptiness. Later on, it's also pointed out that there is no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, and so forth until no realm of mind consciousness. And you gotta love any sutra that includes and so forth as part of the formal text. So basically that's your, your six senses, six sense uh, actions and six objects of actions. Eyes see things. I'm looking at tiny little pictures of everybody in front of me right now. I hear, my ears hear plenty of traffic usually behind me. Right. So those are the 18 Dattus and they're all empty. Now in five mountain order, we define emptiness or shunyata as uh, unbounded openness. So emptiness doesn't necessarily have any sort of negative connotation, but all five skandhas and all those senses and sense objects and they're all empty. They're empty because they are subject to causes and conditions, right? That's one of my favorite DT Suzuki things is, says all conditioned dharmas are subject or conditioned by emptiness. Um, I like that characterized by part. So, these things being uh, characterized by emptiness, they have no self nature, right? So if you lose your eyes or your sight, do you become less you or more you because of it? One of the symptoms of COVID is loss of a sense of smell and taste. So are you more you or less you if that happens? If you go blind, does that make you not you or did having sight somehow constitute a solid, permanent, self-natured you Now, uh, usually in the West, with the exception of, I guess, science fiction movies, we think of having five senses, right? In Buddhism, we count mind as the sixth sense. And sometimes that's where some confusion comes in. Um, it might be a translation issue. It might be just English not quite having uh, the right word to translate mind in the uh, chitta or jin sense that you have in Sanskrit or Chinese. Um, and, you know, you've got a brain and its action is that it thinks and thinks about things. And somehow that's a little less concrete than having eyes, seeing and seeing a half dozen little tiny pictures on a screen in front of you. If you start thinking about things of an epistemological uh, nature or are considering Kant's prolegomena on any future, future metaphysics, 
then you get into this whole other realm where you're thinking about thinking, which just seems to uh, to eat itself eventually. But all that is still conditioned, so it's characterized by emptiness, no problem. But when the great sages refer to mind, which, you know, I'll say has a capital M, um, it's different than the mind that we think of as like our small M mind that might constitute the brain and thinking and things of that nature. So, are they thinking about thinking? Are they thinking about thoughts? Are they thinking the mind is thinking or having thoughts? Uh, no, no, no. Um, the parent Sangha here is original mind Zen Sangha. This is one mind Zen hermitage. You've got open minds, you've got ordinary minds. All of those minds have little to do with either thinking or brains. Um, when you hear things like Mushin or whatever, however you might want to translate no mind, people often think of that as like turning off the thinking, like it's somehow a switch that can be turned off. Like, okay, here I am, I'm going all mooshin on you. And then there's no thinking. And I would have to say that that's probably erroneous because we don't necessarily stop thinking we just enter into a, an unbounded, unobscured state where capital M mind is at the, uh, the base of it and thinking and what's thought about and all that are unimportant, let's say. They're seen for their shunyata nature and consequently, we don't have to pay that much attention to them. We don't have to think that they are somehow permanent or that they are somehow even important. Um, Matsu was asked, what is Buddha? And his answer was, mind is Buddha. Uh, Bojo Chinul, the Korean sage um, said this in a dialogue about uh, sudden enlightenment and gradual cultivation. As long as ordinary people are deluded, they think their bodies are material conglomerates and their minds are random thoughts. They do not know that inherent essence is the true body of reality. They do not know that their own open awareness is the real Buddha. Seeking Buddha outside of mind, they run randomly from one impulse to another. I like Chinul a lot. I, every time I read something that's attributed to him and it, it just makes so much sense. So when he's talking about the uh, running around from impulse to impulse and thinking that their, their thoughts are something, it just hits home because that describes me and uh, I think it could describe a lot of us on any given day. Shunyata itself 
is a concept, right? Emptiness has no self nature. So even emptiness is an empty concept. So thinking about emptiness is like empty squared. And Janul talks about the sudden enlightenment, gradual cultivation thing. And um, our guiding teacher here, Doshim, uh, has the analogy of water where, you know, there's heat on the stove and you've got the kettle of water and then it keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And if it stops at 211 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's not boiling, is it? And then it hits 212 and bang, boiling enlightenment. And then I often think of um, how you maintain that boiling enlightenment. Like if you've ever made pasta and wanted it to not come out stiff like little sticks, you know that you've got to keep that heat applied. So that's the gr gradual cultivation part. Um, he talks about how once you've had the sudden enlightenment, you have to keep that heat applied. You have to have that gradual cultivation so you don't get lazy and slip back into the bad karmic habits we might have. Uh, here's something else from Junul. Thus, in the experience of enlightened people, even if there are afflictions associated with the external world, all of them produce the most subtle and refined flavor. Just be aware that confusion has no basis, that the illus illusory triple world is like the smoke swirling in the wind, and that phantasmagoric six sense fields are like hot water melting, melting ice. If you can practice this moment to moment, not neglecting to be attentive, seeing to it that concentration are e and insight are equally sustained, then love and hate will naturally lighten and thin out, while compassion and wisdom will naturally increase in clarity. Sinful deeds will naturally end, while meritorious actions will naturally progress. So we live in the world of the skandhas and the senses and we don't necessarily have to let them be what rule our day-to-day -day behavior. When we are able to see them for the empty things that they are, then we can actually um, use them. We can, as Janil says, decrease the delusions and increase our true nature. Hate, anger, all that stuff can go by the wayside and love and loving kindness can increase and seeing all those things as empty is part of it. And as we cultivate our practice, that's part of where we'll end up, is that state where things are lessened that are uh, unwholesome and things that are wholesome are naturally increased. So, the question is, how can we, in a very concrete way, maintain the essence of that open, unbounded, aware, aware mind, even when we're living in a world that's governed by the skandhas and the senses?
so the first question I ask you is, what is the essence of mind, not of thoughts, though? Can the senses, including brain, thinking, and thought, and this God is be used to attain uh, one original, ordinary, open mind? We don't eradicate the skandhas or the senses or the action of the senses or the object of the action of the sense. We just use them as tools. They're hammers. With our unbounded awareness, we see the hammer for what it is. It's a hammer. It's not the house. 